there's parts of this neighborhood that are worse than neighborhoods that I've seen in, in Iraq. They're the drug runners. You better believe it. When you get a taste of that money and the lifestyle that comes with it, it just changes. where I live. This is not a just a job for me. This is not a service project. This is my home. So you're in my living room. What we do is try to apply that military mentality, that mindset, that tenacity, same tenacity as a combat operation, and apply it to community service. We can push the drugs out, not by arresting our way out the problem, but just making it very, very uncomfortable for anyone who wants to do bad there to do it. Simplify. 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 Do a job, man. Yeah, man. Well, it makes me think that we can do it. We're not afraid to come here. Every day I walk out, I see someone dealing. It's not one day I've walked out and have not seen some sort of drug transaction in the neighborhood. There's three sides of Oliver. There's the drug dealers, the drug users, and the people who got caught in between. You know, and that's unfortunate. The Oliver neighborhood in East Baltimore, notorious for its drug trade, made even more so by its depiction in the HBO series, The Wire. If you walk through the garden, you better watch your back. If you live here long enough, you'll see the dealers, you'll see the suppliers, you'll see the lookouts, you'll see the watch people, you'll see the enforcers, you'll see all of that. The guy on the left is the executive director of Come Home Baltimore, which makes a business of distressed housing. He's a former Army Ranger, and he moved to Oliver after he left the service and found he wanted to continue serving. We're not using his name because the way he serves now has occasionally made him a target. Oh, there they go. I knew it wasn't, they weren't too far away. They the drug runners. <laughs> you better believe it. That's Rich Blake. Now, this rebuilding this park over here by Oliver and Bethel. He's the executive director of the Sixth Branch, a service organization made up mostly of Iraq and Afghanistan vets. What we do is uh, try to apply that military mentality, that mindset, that tenacity, same tenacity as a combat operation, and apply it to community service. Their current mission Operation Oliver get rid of the drugs, the blight, and the flight. So we just bought these right here. 1712, 1714, 1716, 1718. Oh, these things are collapsed. Really? Collapsed in the inside and everything. Well, we figured if we could buy this whole side right here, somebody else would pick up this side, stabilize that. We're trying to purchase the majority of the vacants in, in Oliver. Inside the vacants, you have people shooting drugs, you have people living in them, starting fires, you have those houses burning down, burning down other people's houses, you have rapes that occur in these vacants. So much occurring in vacants. I mean, a lot of the problem, the drug problem, comes from the fact that drug dealers can stash in the vacants and no one can be held accountable. This is kind of a working class, predominantly African American um, neighborhood. Uh, that uh, stayed working class up until probably 20, 25, 30 years ago when it started becoming a, a much more uh, impoverished area with a lot of a vac vacant housing. As you can see that it was a really viable neighborhood at one point by this sort of classic Baltimore marble steps, these very carefully polished marble steps. Two things happened in the early 80s and 90s in Baltimore. Industrial or blue collar jobs began making their way out of the city and drugs became a national commodity. In Baltimore, heroin was and is the drug of choice. 
growing up here. It was just a regular neighborhood. Dwayne Hurt lived in Oliver until he joined the Marine Corps in 1980, deployed to Panama, and eventually returned to his old stomping grounds, where jobs had become few, but the local industry was flourishing. I started uh, selling drugs. Well, what I think changed is uh, the opportunity to make more money quicker and the lifestyle and everything. I mean, that was low, one of the most straight person. Oh, that I'm never going to sell drugs. I'm never going to do this. When you get a taste of that money and the lifestyle that comes with it, it just changed. That's when he got the street name Hollywood. Hey, Chillo, that was my man. Yeah, he named me Hollywood. When the lifestyle was so nice and good. You know, it just looked it so nice. I mean, you go in the club with your chains and sweatsuits and cars and everything, and you get all the attention from the ladies. And, and I went from a uh, golden boy to a uh, felon. After selling for four or five years, he began using, and things unraveled from there. At my worst is when I started uh, robbing people. My drug at first was cocaine, and then people would see me hyper, and then, hey, try some of this. And then that's when I got into her one. One time I laughed at guys and girls that I would see walking around with pipes and like, man, I'll never do that. <laughs> Lo and behold, never say never. <laughs> Next thing you know, I was carrying a pipe. It lost my business, but uh, I did it to myself. Hollywood's been clean for two years now, but a record of more than 20 incarcerations and several felony convictions makes hard work of finding a job. Hollywood's a great person. He, he represents all that is right with Baltimore and all that is wrong with Baltimore. And the man has discipline. It's just that he's another forgotten veteran. Yeah, Super five, five, five. Do a job, man. Yeah, man. You doing all right? I hire him every chance I get, I will give him a job. I trust him because of the, the values I know that he had. And all I need to know was that he had those values at one time. It doesn't take nothing for him to retap into that. And when he works for me, he works hard. Okay, man. It's a policy he enforces liberally locally. Now, we built the houses on Bond Street. Right. And we're going to be doing some more construction. So also, if you're looking for labor work or work, anybody looking for work, my number's on there. Give me a call and I'll try to Squeeze everybody I, in I can. Drug addiction and unemployment are just two symptoms, according to Dr. Peter Bielinson, of the widespread urban decay depicted in The Wire. He says the show's creators picked Oliver because it's the perfect microcosm. It wasn't a police drama. It wasn't about guns and cops and robbers. It was very much a commentary on the failure of institutions in the urban areas all over the country, not just Baltimore. Many affected by those failures, like Hollywood, are veterans who live here. One World War II vet has lived in Oliver for 46 years, but he didn't want to talk with us for fear of retaliation. So, in part, the idea of Operation Oliver is to also help those who've served by creating a veteran-sponsored community where veterans of drug wars and veterans of world wars meet veterans of current wars. Well, a, a veteran-sponsored community is an idea that's kind of evolved. The idea is just that, you know, to kind of, the veterans to kind of a, a, adopt a neighborhood and, and, and oversee it, monitor it, and fill all the gaps that, uh, you know, that the police cannot take care of. Their battle plan when we come back. And if we can lift up this neighborhood, then we can lift up this city. And we don't have to stop there. Operation Oliver. Can we get a hoo-ha? Yeah! 
Okay, and then I choose a group? Yeah, so whatever you'd like to do. We have weed eating, tree removal, burning, um, raking, tree planting, trash pickup, and yeah. the alley so units are mobile so units where they go around in like the truck and pick up uh, trash and other things that have been collected by the group. So what do you want to do? Dozens of volunteers, some students, many veterans, descend upon Oliver one chilly Saturday morning for an outdoor service day. It's cosmetic, but intended as a salve for what lies beneath. This is where I live. This is not a, just a job for me. This is not a service project. This is my home. So you're in my living room. All right? So we're, we're family now. Real close family. Okay. Oliver was a neighborhood that used to be no different than Canton or Phil's Point. You know, we had houses that were doctor's offices and lawyer's offices living next to middle class and upper class. And then one day, people started to leave. And drugs came in, the houses started to be abandoned, and this is what we have today. It's, it's sad, but you're here to change that. In 2003, uh, it was March, I was standing in the group just like you're standing in now. And we were receiving the order from our commanding officer to, to cross the, the border into Iraq. And he, in his speech, he used, uh, he used the comment that the, the hopes of mankind were resting on our young shoulders. And, and at that moment, I thought that what I was doing was the most important thing in my lifetime. But I, but I was wrong, because what we're doing today is the most important moment in my lifetime because this is on our soil, and we can sustain this, uh, and we can rebuild this. Well, it's a green space, actually having kind of a soccer field, for instance, or a multi-purpose sports field. It's interesting that, that veterans are doing this because it's not so different than, you know, being on deployment. I mean, actually, this neighborhood, there's parts of this neighborhood that are worse than neighborhoods that I've seen in, in Iraq. Going into an area with a population that you may not know that well, getting to know that population slowly by doing, trying to do good work, and not being able to connect with them before when you were overseas because you didn't share the same language, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of distrust of what you're doing. That's yeah. In intelligence, we have to understand where we're operating and we have to get to know the area and what, what exactly is going on. So I guess that would be a good way to compare the two. Right behind you. Pretty gross the last one. Most of them are tied, some of them are not. I feel like I have a perspective that when I go overseas to Afghanistan or Iraq and I see communities that frankly are a lot like this. <laughs> if uh, in some ways this community is worse off because they have all the resources over there. You know, they got hundreds of thousands of soldiers and all the money that they need um, and a lot of attention and these neighborhoods kind of get forgotten. Watch out guys. At the end of the day, um, we're trying to redefine who the veteran is. When B.R. McDonald left the military, he continued his service by founding VAP, the Veteran Artist Program. Some of its members consider Oliver a sort of blank canvas. It's looking a lot better. Um, we sort of went with a theme of renewal um, because that's the overall arching goal of this, uh, product, or this project. Private property, no trespassing, no loitering. Basically here in Baltimore, a lot of the abandoned row houses have that plywood put up by the city and that saying on the doors is kind of iconic uh, here in Baltimore. Um, she's pulling the door away from its, the door frame that it's been nailed into uh, just to kind of like breathe new life into the structure. It gives back to this community in that way you know, that we can alter, alter an old wall and give it new life just like the theme of our mural here. But just up the street, the local drug industry thrives. Yeah, the street got real clean all of a sudden. 
corners got real, real quiet. So members of the sixth branch do what comes naturally. Boots to ground, they set about winning hearts and minds in Oliver. Hey, man, let me give you this fly. We having a cleanup next Saturday of a park. Uh -huh. The one right here by the stop sign, you know, by the liquor store. Uh -huh. Those two big green spaces, we're just uh -huh. cleaning it up. That's it. And when we walk in the community, when we're, when the drug activity stops, the streets disappear. For that moment that we're walking the street, they're not dealing drugs. There's one less child getting drugs. It's one less person caught up in a, in a shootout. It's one less person shooting up drugs just by our presence. So if we can multiply that and have veterans in the community and walk in the community, we, we, we've made an impact. They're dealing on that corner. They're dealing on that corner right there, though. Oh, yeah. Oh, they definitely looking up. Yeah, we're going to pass our flies. We're going to go right over there, right where they're dealing at. The veterans have, you know, the unique experience of being in dangerous areas, so that doesn't scare us to come to this neighborhood. The, everyone definitely thinks that I'm either a social worker or a police officer because I'm, because I'm white, and this is a predominantly African-American neighborhood. But every time they see me or my car, they usually yell out, you know, narco or to, to, to give the tip that there could be a cop in the area or a snitch in the neighborhood. We ran into police patrolling the area, but they're not looking for lower level drug runners. Their investigations are more focused on bigger fish. One crew we ran into had picked up a drug related murder suspect in Oliver that morning. No, the police haven't given up. What was happening for a while under the previous mayor um, was they were arresting huge numbers of people a year. And 20 or 30 percent were wiped off the books because they were not good arrests. And it was during that time, about 10 years ago, that I think there was a lot more distrust, mistrust, and distrust of the population with the police. But who doesn't trust a veteran? You know, who... America has given the veterans such a good image that they know we're not here to harm them, but they also know we're not here to, to play around with them. This is the local barber shop. The decor and the folks the former Marine and soldiers see in there raise suspicions, which makes it a stop on their patrol route. Because I'm pretty sure that it has a lot to do with, with drugs. Because Caroline Street has a lot of drug activity, and a lot of the people that I see in that drug activity are in the barber shop, but they're not getting their hair. This neighborhood is full of runners. Most of the runners are people, they only get paid money to get paid with drugs because they're also users. Joke with them, laugh with them. That's on the outside. On the inside, they know who I am, I know who they are. You know, it's a weird relationship. We can push the drugs out, not by arresting our way out the problem, but just making it very, very uncomfortable for anyone who wants to do bad there to do it. Who doesn't know the Marine with the manicured lawn with the flag in his front that nobody messes with on the block? Every community has that guy, you know, and we, we can multiply that by 10 and put a veteran on each block. We can secure a neighborhood that way. If you take back a corner and then a block and kind of move block by block, you can do that. But again, in order to do that, you've got to attract people back in, not just for safety, not just because they feel safer, but because there's opportunity in that neighborhood. And the opportunity, again, relates to decent schools for parents and grandparents for their kids and grandkids, health care, decent housing, and livable wage jobs. A new grocery store is a beacon in what Bielensen calls a food desert. Bond Street, where Come Home Baltimore has purchased 23 homes, is no longer an open air drug market, according to residents. And the nonprofit has hired as many as 50 local residents to help with construction. To Bielensen's point on kids, the sixth branch encourages local teenagers to help with cleanup projects and to keep an eye toward college. Over there is uh, your business classes, selling your home over there. And uh, you'll do a lot of your uh, foreign language classes in this building directly from. I'm a doctoral student here at Loyola, so I thought it would be cool to, you know, bring the boys to Loyola. We're, so we brought a couple students up here, a couple to talk to them, answer questions about going to school, um, have some athletes talk to them about, you know, college life and sports. And then 
you graduate from undergraduate school and then you go to what's called graduate school. There's so many obstacles that you know kids in East Baltimore face and sometimes college seems like such a hard goal to achieve, such a distant place in their minds. And the more you can expose them that, the more that they can you know understand that this is a very real possibility. You might be interested in becoming an astronomer? I want to be an astronomer. So there's counselors at your schools um, that you can talk to to have an idea of <clears throat> what classes I need to take in high school to be ready for college. When we come back, their final deployment soothes the scars from the past. I have a lot of memories of the kids, and I, I took a lot of pictures of the kids. combat marine. I uh, had my own struggles with transition to civilian life and post-traumatic stress disorder. Sometimes the streets of Oliver trigger memories Rich has long put behind him. Sometimes there's smells that are familiar, you know, rancid trash that's been there for a while. Uh, but I have a lot of memories of the kids. And I, I took a lot of pictures of the kids. And, uh, you know, they were, I don't know, they, they were just so happy. And I think it was just because they, they couldn't really comprehend you know what was really going on. After my deployment, I think it must have been July or August, I came home and I was immediately discharged. Like, bam, I went home to Ohio. I, I think the best way to describe it, it was I was bored. Uh, I was sad just because I didn't have a mission. All my, all my buddies, my built-in family network, all that support is gone. Real quick, if you are a veteran, we want you to move in here. So get with us and we'll make that happen. And I think now that we've you know, found this effort, it's kind of becoming my, my main deal. I treat veterans at the Veterans Hospital. And what we see is, you know, a lot of the problems that veterans have with PTSD and substance abuse, yes, a lot of that is attributed to post-traumatic stress disorder. Those symptoms are real, that disorder is valid. But what I see a lot of is they miss that sense of purpose that they have. They used to have a job that people's lives depended on them. They thought that they were, you know, changing the world. We were, you know, moving into foreign countries and it just felt so important and purposeful. And, we had that brotherhood, and when you leave, you know, all of that is gone. We've already seen that if you give a veteran, uh, even like myself, you know, something meaningful to do again, like this, which in a sense could be a little bit more meaningful than what we did over here because it's, um, it's, this is home, um, then, you know, they can start to feel better. Army Ranger? Yes. What'd you do? Uh, clear caves. <laughs> Basically it. I mean... Kind of the same. Kind of the same. After the Army, a job at his father-in-law's landscaping company in Mississippi paid the bills, but left a certain void in his soul. His wife, however, dreamed of a big house down south. Me and my wife went through a lot of ups and downs. I mean, there was arguments, there were violent spells that I went through, you know. Sometimes my wife felt safe around me, sometimes she didn't. You know, there was a lot of things I've lost. To Loss of purpose, not, nothing really to do. What do you do after you went from what you thought was the most important thing in the world to coming home, working in a retail store? I mean, how, how does that transfer? I have a sense of purpose now. You know, I've taken all that anger, all that sadness, all that frustration, and I've put it into something positive, which is taking this community and, and, and making it into a place where I want to live. He makes a point of leaving two chairs, a table, and some books out front of the house he and his wife, also a veteran, bought when it was a shell. That's where he has his morning coffee. It's just normal to do these things. People do it every single day in their neighborhoods. Why can't we do it in Oliver? I had been in, served my time honorably. And now looking back, I should have gave them that 20. <laughs> when I came back to Baltimore, that was the transition. I should have stayed away from Baltimore. Woulda, shoulda, coulda. So I never came back to Baltimore, man. I feel like John Guy, Teflon King. <laughs> And I'm uh, feeling better, look a lot better. I just turned 50 years old last month. And 
it's a whole lot of males, females that just aren't here. It's a lot of killing, a lot of kids just dying early, and it can be prevented. Hollywood bunks next to the Army Ranger. The former Marine says he's learned a lot from the 6th Branch about taking care of himself and about giving back. Operation Oliver helped get him into a job retraining program, but he's also found his passion. Deep down inside, my thing is, if I'm ever able to, is to talk to kids now. Like, because if someone would have came to my high school, junior high school, we, we never had like mentors and motivational speakers. I have this thing when I walk by the daycare center and you know the teachers aid and all that, I'll be walking with the little four and five years old and I said maybe out of that crowd there's a next congressman or maybe even president or a doctor or a nurse and, and these little kids and what's going to happen to them? Who's going to lead them? Who's going to tell them right from wrong? We have a lot more people now trying to do more things for the community from the mayor on down. But sometimes the good things aren't talked about. My plan now is to uh, complete this probation program that I'm on, uh, staying uh, clean and straight. And uh, in five years, hopefully, only near a few houses for property or something, you know. Just keep moving forward. But it was a long time when if you asked me, well, what do I plan to do in five years? I couldn't tell you. I'm living for the day. So times are changing. I don't know. Now everyone's looking at us like we're crazy. But that's okay. We are crazy. <laughs>